Hello and welcome to The Valley Today. I am your host, Janet Michael. It's The Valley Business Today with the SBA. Carl Knobloch, Virginia District Director of the Small Business Administration, made the trip down from Richmond several weeks ago for our monthly conversation with a small business here in the Shenandoah Valley. March is Women's History Month. So our guest today features Holly Redding. She is one of the owners of Winchester Brew Works. Holly and her business partner and brewer, Bonnie Landy, were the first women-owned brewery slash brewers in the state of Virginia when they opened in 2016. So we are sitting today at Winchester Brew Works. We are here with Holly... Redding. Redding. I almost (laughs) said Holly Landy. Which is... Which is the combination of you and Bonnie. Yeah. I, know, right? I do answer to both. <laughs> Holly Redding is here with us. She is one of the owners of Winchester Brew Works. It is Carl Knobloch Day, Small yeah. Business Administration Day. <laughs> Carl has traveled down from Richmond. Carl, I'm excited that we were able to get in and chat with Holly today at Winchester Brew Works. It is Women's History Month. So yes. showcasing yeah. women-owned businesses was at the top of our list. Absolutely. And I'm so excited to hear this story. I've been waiting for this. Holly, for yeah. someone who isn't familiar with Winchester Brew Works, tell me a little bit about who you guys are, how you got started, and then we'll fast forward as we go through our conversation. Winchester Brew Works, we had our soft open in March of 2016, so coming up on eight years of being open. It's just been a labor of love this whole time. It's two different couples, so it's myself and my husband, Arthur, and my business partner, Bonnie, and her husband, Jeff. We decided, probably back in 2014, maybe this is a thing we're interested in, but being an entrepreneur is terrifying. Were you brewing beer in your we basement? We were homebrew. Yeah, we okay. were homebrewing, and we had homebrewed for years. My husband got into it when he was in college with some friends. We brewed together as couples. We always said it it takes beer to make beer, so we're <laughs> drinking at 10 in the morning, sampling beers while we're brewing a batch, and really loved it, and it's a lot of fun, but that's just a hobby. It takes a lot more commitment to open a business, and honestly, almost none of opening the brewery was beer. It was so much just business, and begging for money and all that stuff that goes into opening up a small business but we sat on it for a while bonnie actually came to me back in 2014 and said i really think we should do this and i was like that sounds not great i don't think i'm interested (laughs) i don't think this sounds like a good idea but we just kept thinking about it and at the time we lived in harrisonburg where we were all working but jeff one of my partners is going to school at shenandoah and so we were coming up here for apple blossom at the time hot blossom craft beer festival still existed mm-hmm. it had been going on for a couple years at that point lots of craft beer bars were in town and then we'd come to watch him do some presentations and we just fell in love with this little town it just felt like home to us much more than harrisonburg did so we decided if we're actually going to pursue this let's do Winchester. At the time, there were no breweries. I was going to say it was a whole different market. It was very different. Escussion, who we love, was getting started. I think they had already maybe formed their LLC, trademarked their name, but they hadn't opened. So we were on track to be the first or second brewery to open in the area. Harrisonburg already had several breweries at the time. So we came here for a long weekend. We rented a hotel in town and explored. (laughs) We interviewed business owners on the walking mall to see what they loved or didn't love about being a small business owner in Winchester. We shopped around at different places that were for rent and went ahead and paid to be an LLC that weekend. We formed our LLC with some company on the internet that seemed <laughs> legitimate and became an LLC back then in 2014 and then started pursuing the business then. It took a long time to get open. We didn't open until March of 2016, but we started in 14, kind of on the trajectory to open. And this is not a inexpensive business to start. No. Like for me, <laughs> when I started Java Media, I just needed my brain, a printer, and a computer. Yeah. I didn't need an office. I didn't need any other equipment. That is not at all the case when you are going to get into the weeds on actually brewing beer for the masses. Yeah, absolutely. And one of our goals being such a small business, we didn't have a lot of capital at the time we were in our early 30s. We didn't have a lot to, to offer financially. So we wanted to keep things on the lower cost side. So we did buy a lot of equipment used. We bought a bunch of stuff off auction. All the chairs in this tasting room, I think there's 90 of them. We bought them all from some Italian restaurant that went out of business. We scraped gum off the bottom of chairs for like three months. It was awful. But we just cobbled things together as we could. We, of course, put in some of our own money. Some family members were kind enough to gift us money. We did take out a pretty small loan, and we did a really successful Kickstarter fundraiser that was truly incredible. People in the community that did not know a thing about us and outside of the community just showered us with money. And we won a Kickstarter campaign of the day once, which was huge. We met our stretch goal, and then another stretch goal, and then another stretch goal. 
It's important to jump in and point out here yeah. too that Kickstarter wasn't all that well known either. I don't know. So that the it, fact yeah. that in a small no, community was... like this, where people have no real idea of what that means, are still going on the internet and giving money to something Absolutely. that may never come to fruition. Right. And we had a Facebook page for the brewery, but we didn't have hardly anybody following us. We didn't <laughs> exist yet. So I think it, that was just word of mouth, and then people in town that were just excited to finally have a brewery. People love craft beer, and there wasn't anywhere to drink yet at a local brewery. So people were just excited to help us get our feet off the. Did you decide fairly early on that you wanted to be in the downtown hub or did you look at places maybe over at Pleasant Valley or in other parts of Winchester? No, we knew we wanted to be in town. So we looked at a few different locations, but we just kept coming back to this property on Cameron Street. It was vacant. It had been on the market for at least, at least four or five years at that time. It was just a white concrete box. Mm -hmm. What we loved about it is only a block or so off the walking mall, but we have our own parking lot. There's sidewalks to easily access the downtown walking mall. We have street parking that's really ample. It was just a really great spot for us. And then at the time we didn't have a patio, but there was green space we knew we could convert. And price per square footage on the walking mall, it's pretty outlandish, but you pop right off. And we have a 5,000 square foot facility. It's enormous. So we looked at a few other places in town. The EDA was kind enough to point us in the right direction, share with us all the opportunities in town, things that were for lease. But the spot on Cameron Street, we just kept coming back to and loved it. Something she said a second ago, Carl, that stands out to me because I'm guessing that you don't get this a lot is we came to town and we walked around and we talked to other small business owners about what it's like to have a business in this town. <laughs> How many times do you find yourself wishing that new business owners would do that kind of research? Yeah, it's amazing how they come back and they say like the local EDA is not friendly, but they didn't realize that until they already made the investment. Or they sat there and they said, you know, they have little taxes in here that I didn't know about, and, and all those things. And then also the discomfort, especially if the community is struggling, where potentially a store that's an indirect competitor, not a direct competitor mm -hmm. of yours, sits here and feels threatened that you're gonna take business from them and then that's gonna hurt them. So yeah, there's a lot of dynamics that I give you guys tons of credit that that should be like numero uno. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. when, uh, that well, should be done when you're coming into an area that you're not clear right, what's going absolutely. on. Absolutely, and even if you do live in that area, you don't know what the business you only like know it like, as a shopper only, perspective right, or right. a resident so before we opened we started attending the old town business owners association meetings before we even had an open date i joined the hot blossom planning committee as a sponsor and started attending their meetings to help plan their craft beer festival we just super wanted to get involved and we did and i think that was huge for us in this little community and you're right i think that sometimes other businesses get a little, ooh, I don't know if we need another small business to come in, or this might be a competition to me because I sell craft beer or whatever, and we didn't want that. I wanted to be friends with people here. <laughs> I think part of the thing that we love about the brewing community is as new breweries have come in, and what we did is we went straight to the other existing brewery that opened right before we did and introduced ourselves and asked for a tour of their space and made friends with them, and other breweries have done the same to us that have opened after we've opened, and I think that that just goes a long way. It's one of the things that, and you and I have had this conversation many times, and I've had it with other local breweries, that really is unique, mm -hmm. I think, to brewery businesses in general, is they don't see any of the others as direct competition. They are all into, please don't do this. We did this and it was a terrible <laughs> mistake yes. and it cost us a ton of money. They are, can we loan you this piece of equipment? Something broke, I bet our thing will fix this. Let's get it to you. Do you need me to send over a bartender for a night because yours has COVID. Yeah. All of yeah. the things. You guys are really tight yeah. in helping each other regardless of what it necessarily reflects on your bottom line. Yeah, absolutely. You have to be. It follows what I call the restaurant concept. Mm. And the reason I say that is I want to come to your brewery. That's where I'm set. I'm going there. I come in, the line's out the door. It's just packed. But I want to have a beer. <laughs> so I'm going to go to another location and get the beer. Eventually I will get to Brewer and, and have that. But this night I can't. And it's the same thing when people say, I'm going to this restaurant and it's packed. Mm. But the family wants to eat. They're hungry. <laughs> so I compromise and I go someplace else. But the thing is, that's where everybody wins. And knowing you'll return. Absolutely. Yeah because that's what you wanted and that's yeah. what everybody's going to do and when there's clusters i always say that's a win 
no matter what, that's Absolutely. a win. Yeah. You just don't truly understand how much that's a win versus being the only one. Because if you're the only one and I come here and every time I come here, it's packed. Right. I will never come here again. Right. And Absolutely. now and eventually it dies out. With this, I get my palate, different tastes, different flavors. Mm -hmm. And I you get, find your home base, yeah, what right. we've learned. So you always get a little anxious. Even though you're supportive, you find out another brewery's opening and you're like, oh no, we're already in a small town. What happens if they take a certain portion of our customer base? Every customer is going to try the new place in town, of course. Yeah. And they'll either find that, hey, this actually suits my palate or my social needs yes. better. Or they'll come back to, we call it the third place. We have so many people that homework and brew works like that's what they do and we love that but i find that we all the breweries in this town specifically have a very different niche they focus on different styles of beer they have different atmosphere different you, you wouldn't know none of them look like a cookie cutter brewery no, when you walk in not. the door we're super family friendly so we really focus on that we've got changing tables in the bathrooms and kids games we all have children as well so we really want to focus on that there's another brewery in town that's super dog friendly we don't allow dogs indoors so everybody fits mm -hmm. into their little spot and we love that once you got in and got open what was the biggest thing you feel like you had to overcome? Was it getting the word out? Was it process of making the beer? What was the biggest hurdle you think you had to cross? It was truly the time commitment. So for a little background, I had a baby two months too early. She surprised <laughs> us in February of 2016 and our soft open was slated for March 26th. Mm. <laughs> so I was recovering from having a baby too early. I had a tiny human who should not really be out in public, especially in winter times. Mm -hmm. I think just finding the time, it, I still lived in Harrisonburg actually. So my wow. husband and I were still in Harrisonburg. So I was driving up here. My in-laws, thank God, lived in Berryville. So I would stay there. So that was a relief to have a safe local space to stay. But I think Bonnie and I tried to do too much. We were nervous about the financial side because we had opened months later than anticipated. So we had burned through the capital that we had for opening and stuff. So we were scared to hire a bartender, scared to pay for this thing. So we tried to run the bar, we tried to do all the brewing, we tried to do it all, and that was too much. <laughs> it doesn't take long to get burned out. So I think just our time commitment was our hardest hurdle. Obviously getting the word out, but our grand opening was in May. So we soft open in March, had a giant grand opening in May after we worked the kinks out. And it's still, the exception of our five year anniversary, our highest grossing day. Wow. And so it really just, yeah, I mean, we we've done tons of big events that are large for us, but until we had our five year anniversary, which only beat it out by a couple hundred dollars, <laughs> our highest grossing day ever was our grand opening in 2016. So I think that we were successfully spreading the word, but that's also overwhelming when you've got pretty much two people doing it all. So. Yeah. And that's a common theme for what we talked about last month with Marie is that as a business owner, you feel mm -hmm. like you've got to do it all uh -huh. because it's too expensive to outsource anything. We had that literal example that conversation last yeah, month. Yeah, and I think that's the one fatal mistake most businesses make mm. is they plan, let's just say your date was basically November. Right. Okay. It and was you, originally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and that's what I was back forecasting. Literally, that's yeah. what I was doing. I was sitting here, okay, March, or probably November yeah. was their yeah, open date. it truly was. And, and, and the reason is because people think everything's going to fall perfect. Mm. And it doesn't. And I always tell them, I said, if you're not adding at least a 25% buffer, you're already going to be behind the power yeah. curve. Typically, it's probably closer to 40%. And that's what you try to get people to understand because it keeps everything more in control. And yeah. less stressful. Yeah. Yeah. If less you can plan yeah. for November and think, hey, if it happens in March, great. You're not freaking out <laughs> yeah. in February that, oh my gosh, it has to be next month. Yeah. 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 And that's why a lot of businesses actually, and I, I commend you because you were able to keep your doors open. Most end up shutting their doors mm. within a year wow. after that because they drain themselves so bad. They were just so far back. Then they can't the debt, maintain. Yeah, yeah. The debt they owed and everything else. Just like. I commend you for being innovative enough, especially in this area, and you're right on, Janet, what you were saying, Kickstarter. I love Kickstarter. Yeah. It's a great tool if used properly, and this is actually a good model for using <laughs> Kickstarter. There's some other ones where people go, and I go, yeah, I don't want to go there. But you go ahead if you want, but no, it's not going to happen. But this is a great model. This one works really well, even if they're not local. They're going to sit here and invest and because I think of other parts of the country that have microbreweries and things like that are established. They know the benefits, so they invest mm -hmm. because they want success. Mm -hmm. And then also 
that actually lets them plan a road trip here. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. To say, where's my investment oh, yeah. and what did I really get out of this? Yeah. Which reinforces for future investments that they will invest mm -hmm. in other microbreweries if they have a good experience. So it's a win-win yeah. for everyone. Yeah, and what we did as far as how to design a Kickstarter campaign, because we had never done one, of mm. course, we watched other breweries that had had incredibly successful campaigns. And so we watched those, learned from them, what works, what doesn't work. We watched some terrible ones, some really good ones. <laughs> we were lucky enough to have a friend who does video work and editing and stuff that did that for us. I think that that definitely helped was just seeing some of those other campaigns that maybe weren't great or were super successful in other parts of the country. Yeah, I was doing workshops literally on Kickstarter. Oh, wow. Really? And I, yeah. And people are looking like, why? I said, because this is a good way to get revenue. It was. If you're in particular sector. It's, and I said, it's, it's the same as Shark Tank, but you don't yeah. have to give up any ownership. No. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing. You just is. have to give a koozie or yeah. some sort yeah. of extra perk. Yeah. And, and whatever. Cozy sell really they do sell every really day. Well. <laughs> one of our biggest goals in prepping for this, one of our hopes, was that we would not have to take on an investor. Yes, we had a bank that we owed money to, but we did not want anybody telling us how to brew, what to brew, what to mm -hmm. do with our decorations indoor. It, I didn't want anybody else doing that. Bonnie and I had this plan in our head, and we really wanted to go that way, and we didn't want anybody else telling us we're doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> or you're not doing enough. Or then, if you're struggling to make ends meet, but you're still have to pay off an investor. It was too much. So we went the route of the Kickstarter campaign and it was great. It was a lot of work, mm -hmm. a it lot is. of work. It was a lot of work pushing it online. It was a lot of work once it came to fruition and we needed to send out all the things we promised we would. We had a slew of friends in this very empty tasting room. We had like folding packaging tables, things, packaging <laughs> stuff and calling the post office. How do we deliver 120 <laughs> boxes? Like, Did how you do, we do, this? do a 30 day or a 60 day? I think it was a 60 day. 60 I think we day. ended up doing a 60 day. Okay, that's a um, long haul. And though. our initial goal, it was so many years ago now. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Do they keep those on Kickstarter? Can I go back and find oh, our Kickstarter campaign? Okay. Yeah, yeah. It, nice. it, yeah, should, just, yeah. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's so silly. But yeah. it went over extraordinarily well. And I think our minimum was a dollar. Okay. And you'd get your name on the website. Uh -huh. And it's still there to this day. And then it went all the way up to $1,000, which I think three different people did. Most of them were family. But <laughs> but you got your own beer brewed. Whatever style you wanted, we were going to brew that you, for you. Plus you, you got all the brew. other things that... It, the, yeah, uh, it was a stepping lesser. stone yeah. uh, category. Um, so yeah. we had a variety. But, but the biggest challenge with Kickstarter is especially if you're sending out things yeah is if they end up coming from overseas and you never figured that into your cost so structure. we did think through that and uh, the only thing we would to. offer for overseas i think we would offer up to a sticker with a pint glass a very small box uh, okay. and that was the extent like there were there were larger sins we were doing we may not have even done that it may have been whatever we can fit in because the japanese room. market would have been a huge market oh for really yes <laughs> huge they love so think expansion so, okay <laughs> <laughs> right into japan second brewery <laughs> From Winchester into Japan. <laughs> Get the sister suit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Create it. The other thing that I think also adds something else to the dynamic is that you're not a business that's a retail store right. that has a set inventory. You're dealing with alcohol. Right. Not only are you making it and have to make sure those recipes are on point and your equipment is doing what it's supposed to do, I can't even begin to imagine what kind of red tape is oh involved gosh. with so starting <laughs> a business that is making and selling yeah. alcohol. Yeah, it's a lot. We, of course, deal with the state, the VABC, and then we also deal with the TTB, which is the federal program that we deal with. And so you have to get a brewer's license from the TTB. That takes forever. Your document sits on somebody's desk, and they're not pleasant to deal with. <laughs> They need a beer. They don't want to help you, <laughs> even though you're desperate for help. And you don't know if you're doing it right. And they ask for so many things to get started. Once you get there, you're good, right? Once you get that brewer's notice, you're good to go as long as you're paying your taxes, <laughs> of which there's also a lot. And then in the city of Winchester, just to have a business license that was a brewery, because breweries were new to the area, they just charged this arbitrary dollar amount for your business license. So in addition to your retail business license you're paying for, you're then paying... I think it was an additional $500 fee just because you're a brewery. Wow. Um, which is way more than somebody selling clothing would have to do, or even a restaurant, I think. So we're lucky that just this year they actually changed that. They pushed it through city council to get rid of that crazy fee, which is a relief because it's just $500 extra dollars at the beginning of the year for nothing. Almost. Well, they go on the model concept that restaurants and things like that, where do you make your money? You make them off the drinks. Right. And so the model thinks, I'm going to reap that because this is just a brewery. So I'm going to get that revenue. And so that's the concept, not 
understanding the actual returns you get for a number of customers that Absolutely. come through they and everything They finally, else. I think, got that. Yeah. And the goal was to benefit small breweries, cideries, and wineries in the area. So that's been great. But there's so much red tape. You have to approve every recipe, any ingredient that's not already on an approved list. If you're putting some sort of a fruit or a spice or a whatever in there, if it's not on this approved list of ingredients from the TTB, you have to submit a formula to get what? that yes. It's a whole thing. Oh my gosh, I am literally thinking that you guys are just creating these things and no, making no, them. No. And once you get that brewer's license that you do have free reign, I have every, no idea. Every beer you do, you have to okay. get approved. And what's the cost for that? I can't even tell you. Yeah. I think it's like $40 a yeah. pop. Our business partner handles it. And that's the big challenge for any company. I'll use the example. I was in polymers. So if I wanted UL approval for something that was going to be used on electrical, mm. that was ten thousand dollars I had to Gosh. pay for my formula. And if I wanted to substitute something out, I had to pay for it to get approved again. Oh my gosh! So this is the challenges that businesses face all the time mm. that lots of people don't see that cost. Yeah, and did you know that going in? We did. Okay. Some things we did not know. For example, you mentioned the small towns have taxes that yeah. that people don't account for. We did not realize because it just wasn't explicitly said to us, and we were only the second brewery to open, that if you're a brewery, you pay meals tax on everything oh, sold mm -hmm. on site. And we did not know that because mm -hmm. we're not selling meals. You we're don't have a beer. kitchen. don't have like... a kitchen. And so that was not great. At the beginning, at the first time we went in, we got a notice like, hey, you owe us money. Because of course we're paying our sales tax in the state of Virginia. We're in Cheshire's looking at that and saying, you owe us this percentage. We did not know that. Mm -hmm. So that was an alarming amount of money. So that was a thing that wasn't explicitly shared that then we started sharing with other breweries coming into town. And FYI, like yeah. this is going to add up really quickly collecting meals tax. So that makes our taxes for on-site consumption a total of 11.3% mm. sales tax plus meals tax. And that is extraordinary. So when somebody sees their beer went up, 11.3% of that isn't mine. It goes to the city or the state. And that's good to know for us on a consumer side mm. because we're all quick. And we've heard so many conversations the last year or two, three years about inflation. Mm. And that's part of it. But we also have to understand that when I come in here, it's not that you've decided you've got a kid to put through college. Right. Well, that may be the case. It is also true. That's not, <laughs> yeah. You're not jacking the beer up $3 more a pint because that's what you've got to cover. There are outside forces. Yes involved with your pricing I mean, plans. today we're supposed to have a grain delivery and freight has gone up so high cost of grain has gone up so high and we're really small so we're not benefiting like some breweries might benefit from these huge trucks full or they have their own silos no we're ordering like once a month for those four beers we're going to brew that month and that's why people have to understand when you say you're craft mm. that Truly. You're, you're paying a cost for that uniqueness yeah and we and have staff small and we have lights to keep on. There's so many things that go into that cost of beer. So when somebody says, ooh, didn't this go up by 50 cents? Yeah, but think about how much more you're paying for pound of chicken at mm. the grocery store. I, hey, my cable bill just went up $12 and it was all in fees. Just it didn't because. have anything to do with adding Absolutely. a special channel or anything. Absolutely. So it's happening across the board. Yeah, and we're seeing that with breweries everywhere. I actually serve also on the board of directors for the National Brewers Association, which is a, an incredible honor. And we talk about that a lot. Like, how are you balancing that with customers? We can't specifically talk about cost because antitrust stuff, yeah. but that's a constant debate. You have to pay pay your bills and you have to pay yourself or you have to pay your staff, but do you lose customers because you've gone up by a dollar a pint? Balancing that out is tricky. The model, for the most part, for craft breweries like yours is not to have a kitchen. When we're talking about right. meals tax and we're talking about food, it's not to necessarily have sandwiches or a full service kitchen. You depend on food trucks. You depend on other things. Was that something you knew and were okay with going yeah. in or did you think maybe you were going to break that mold? No, we knew we wanted to be just a brewery with a tasting room. So in 2012, the law changed. A brewery could be like a winery that's just a tasting room. Maybe they sell cheese and crackers, but that's the extent of it, right? They're not a kitchen. So wineries have been able to have these beautiful tasting rooms since who knows how long. Yeah. Breweries could not. You could not have somebody come and sit at your bar in Virginia. You cannot have somebody come sit at the bar and drink a pint. They could come get a growler of beer or a six pack of beer and take it to their home and drink it, but you are legally not allowed to serve beer on site. Mm -hmm. could, wow. You could do it at a restaurant, of course, but a brewery could not. So in 2012, there was a bill written in that allowed tasting rooms to operate without a kitchen. That made it so much easier. So then you saw this huge boom of breweries in the state of Virginia and elsewhere, of course, just explode. The overhead for a kitchen and dealing with 
staff mm -hmm. and dealing with chefs and cooks, it's just so much. So we do, Janet, rely solely on food trucks. We encourage people to order from local restaurants. Mm -hmm. We have a binder with all the local menus. It's the other part um, to just being a block off the Old Town Mall. So you get that dining experience, yeah. but you get to have it here with a beer. And a lot of them deliver or DoorDash if you don't want to walk downtown to grab it. And then we do sell some small snacks here. We've got pretzels and chips and cookies and candies for the kids and stuff like that. But food trucks have been great and they're finally growing in the area. Too. I'll have to find us a food truck to talk to. We can eat our I've way through that connections. episode. See, that works. <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah, they've filled that void. Once again, what's great about that, especially for the location, is people come in because it's a different food. And yeah. then you're able to also recommend what type beer they should try to match that type food. Mm -hmm. So they can start understanding the different flavors of brews you have yep. that complement the food that's coming in. Yeah. A lot of people don't correlate that. They just keep ordering the same thing. I right. say, no, really. It pairs yeah. really well. Yeah. It's yeah. interesting, too. People think yeah. about that with wine, but they Absolutely. never think yeah, about that with beer. Here. And there might be styles you think you don't like, but if you pair it properly, yeah. it's excellent. So we do try to do the occasional pairing. We do a lot of, like, cookie and beer pairings or fudge and beer pairings at Valentine's Day and stuff. Yeah. What do you think would be the next step? Is this how you want it to kind of stay and maybe add another beer to the tap on a regular basis? Yeah. Do you want to add a second story or make the patio bigger? Where do you think the next thing is going to be? Yeah, so we always thought maybe we'd open up a second location, but as we've seen, maybe this isn't the right way to put it, but the craft beer bubble burst a little mm -hmm. bit, where they exploded and they were all successful. And then they all grew too fast. And they opened up multiple locations or they added big equipment that's very, equipment is so thousands and thousands, mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands sometimes of dollars. And they just can't make ends meet. COVID happened and everything fell apart and nobody's bounced back. We had always thought maybe a second location and we are just not keen on that any longer. We do lease this place, so we don't own it, but we have landlords that are happy to keep renewing our lease because we're <laughs> successful over here. Two years ago or so, we did buy a new kegerator. That's an eight tap kegerator in addition to the 10 that we've always had. And then we have two taps in a separate kegerator. So we can do up to 20 beers at a time. That's probably kind of our cap is about 20 different beers at a time. We try to add a new beer to the tap list every week. And that's one of the great things about being a tiny brewery versus some of these big ones that bought these huge pieces of equipment. Then you're selling You've got thousands to brew of that gallons much. of the same yes. beer. <laughs> Who wants to drink that much? And distribution has slowed down for so many breweries. For a long time, distribution was huge and you could get across state lines and sometimes overseas and export your product and that's not really the case anymore either. We're seeing that slow down. Was that on your radar when you guys first opened, being able to put it in cans and distribute it to grocery stores and other places no, for people to buy? we knew that we would want to be able to sell kegs to local restaurants. That was one of our goals was we want to be on tap at some of our favorite local spots downtown. And that was the extent of it. And we really haven't pushed too far beyond that. We have worked with some friends that own breweries that are much larger and they'll do what's called a contract batch. We brew three barrels at a time, which is about 100 gallons of beer at any one time. Sometimes we can push it to about 140, depending on the style. So that's a three barrel system. Our friends in DC brew on a 30 barrel system. Oh, wow. Mm. So much larger. And we will work with them couple times a year usually to brew a large batch of either something that we can't keep because it just sells so quickly or something that a distributor might want to distribute out. So we'll have them do some canning for us. We do not do any canning here really. We could, it's slow and very manual. Because there are grants and programs mm. through, and it's not through the SBA necessarily. I think it's the USDA. USDA. It's that value add. We don't really have the space to add a canning line here. We don't really have the beer even to support canning very much. So for super special things for an anniversary here or a big release, we might do some manual hand canning of four packs. We do have a crowler machine, so we can do 32 ounce cans of anything you want to just take home off the taps. But I think we kind of love where we're at. We feel comfortable and safe. We continue to grow in the Winchester area, I think. Winchester's growing, built in more customers. And then you asked about maybe expanding this facility. We would love to add a rooftop bar. Yes, um, that was a we would love say that. To. So because we lease this property, it's a big expense to just- That you can't take to, to with you. Right. Right. Our landlord's been kind enough to start speaking with our local EDA about a grant that they offer, a matching grant that might help offset that cost. So we'll an see. Another way to look at that project. One of the things that they're talking about is young people getting trades experience. So you could actually go to the trade school and basically they do the work. It may not be perfect, but they do the work to get the experience 
and then there's just a professional that oversees it to okay. sign off on it. Oh, that would be so great to partner with Laurel Ridge could, Community College. They've yeah. got the welding and, and the construction. And then that looks like a community project using you know, talent within I the like community. like that. That's interesting. That's a thing that you could We've kind of been at, bouncing but. it around for a while, and I don't know if you guys know, but this property, including our building, the old Winchester Towers, everything was purchased recently. It was like in 2020. It was recently bought by another landlord out of Richmond, a property company. So they are developing some supposedly the areas around us over the next couple of years. Because that's um, why Old Town Cidery is gone. Right, because they, they had to meet deadlines for permits to stay active. They had to do some demo work. And so I think that project is still continuing. So it does limit what we're able to do with our outside area because they're going to have buildings really close to us and stuff. So yeah. the way we can build is up. <laughs> yeah, and that's one of the things looking at Winchester, Frederick, Clark area, the growth area of the state. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. And, and we're landlocked and, in the yeah. city. You either got to go up or you got to tear stuff down. There's not a lot of empty <laughs> yeah. space out there. And then you so, run into the problem with the history yeah. and all of the historical buildings. You can't just tear those you down. Cannot. No. And they're very difficult to retrofit that's right. for something so many new. Rules. Yes. And even our building, while it was built in 19... 1960, which does not feel historic to me, it is in the historic district, sure. yeah. so we still have to follow all the same rules that an 18-something building. But see, uh, th what the city needs to take advantage of right now is the renewables push. Mm -hmm. it, how do you integrate renewables? Actually, you mm -hmm. can get funding for that. Put renewables into historical structures. Oh, it's running something off yeah. of solar, doing yeah. Absolutely. any... Absolutely. Yeah. 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 There's so many benefits and tax benefits to that. Yeah. So yeah. I want to talk about two obstacles, yes. one that we've talked about a couple of times already and one that we haven't, but let's start with COVID Ugh. because you've only got <laughs> four not. years under your belt <laughs> Yeah. and hi pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> what was that like in the early days oh. and how did you get through it? What did you learn it from it? It was brutal, but we were so proud of ourselves. We were of course hyper watching the news like everybody was and we were kind of like, surely this isn't actually going to be a thing, but it's only in California <laughs> and other countries, it's not going to bother us. And then two days later. So we were watching it and we were ready as I got so tired of hearing the word pivot, pivot, because that's what everybody <laughs> talked about. But that was your only option. If you wanted to ride that wave, you had to pivot. So we actually closed down our tasting room March 17th, which was St. Patrick's Day was our first day being closed. We announced <sighs> we'd be closed that day A because it just day. felt, yeah, it just felt scary um, at that point. And we yeah. wanted to be proactive. What I did not want was to be physically shut down by the government. I wanted to make sure that our community knew Winchester Brew Works is taking this seriously. They don't want to risk our health. And they have made the proactive decision to close. And then, of course, it was one day later, I think, when we were mandated to be shut. But we may be able to see them, these tiny kegs, these kind yeah. of like Heineken kegs. Yeah. We ordered those so that people could have a lot of beer to take home. <laughs> we were mandated to be closed both indoors and outdoors, but we would let people come in and we would fill their growlers for them. We would, of course, sell off-site beer to go. We started doing deliveries, just Bonnie and I doing deliveries for free, begging people to buy beer. A lot of people started buying kegs. Then we started a small-scale canning operation. We had a canner, a manual canner, kind of crowler machine that could can 16-ounce cans because we weren't selling it in pints for people. So we started doing that. We just did as much as we could to make any kind of money. The community came out in a big way. I've never been so grateful for this little town because we also put a donate button on our website to donate money to our bartenders because they're not making money like they used to. We actually had some people that were working very part-time for fun and we said, we can't keep you here, I'm sorry. <laughs> but our two major staff members here that work behind the bar stayed on and were just incredible supports. It was hard, but we took advantage of any grant opportunity that we could get, we we're gonna do it. Did you do the PPP? So we did, we did the PPP, we did the EIDL. The city did a grant for, I think it was up to $500 for patio heaters because everybody was sitting outside. I think we had to be closed indoors. I can't remember how many weeks it was and then eventually we were able to open up just outside right. it's like March or April is cold still. <laughs> so the city did a reimbursement for patio heaters which was huge for so many of us downtown and that's great too because you can still use we them. still have them <laughs> absolutely absolutely it was great and so we we took advantage of any like free quote unquote money or super low interest loan opportunities that we could do and that kept us afloat and honestly we weathered it really well also the SBA paid our loan for us like it took over paying our loan which was insane and we were not expecting that and then we I think by the end of 2020 our loan that we did not owe a lot on still it was the loan we took out in 2015 to open it was paid off thank it you was, Carl yeah. yeah thank you Anytime. personally Anytime. paying <laughs> 
so it was tremendous. And again, the community was insane. They were so great to us. We still try to take advantage of any outdoor festivals that we could once things started opening up in the fall. We do Ravenwood Renaissance Festival, so we still did that in 2020. And we somehow made it, as did every brewery in Winchester. Did it change fundamentally how you do things here? Was there something that you learned how to do during COVID that you've kept and are still doing that way now? Offsite beer. We always do growler fills to order, but I think we learned having a refrigerator of beer that you can just grab a four pack of and walk out is huge. I think offsite beer, and I think we just learned a little bit more about who we want to be as a business. Bonnie and I, since we've been kids, are rule followers. Like, I'm a rule follower. I don't want to get in trouble, especially not with the government. So when there are rules created, you have to wear a mask, you have to do this, you have to maintain six feet. We're going to follow those rules. I don't know who's going to walk in here and report me for not following those rules. So we had to hold fast to those regulations, the mask wearing and this and that, even if it seems silly, even if you take your mask off to drink, but you have to wear it to order. I know it seems silly, but that was the rule. And we didn't want to get caught not doing it. Who knows who could walk in here from the health department or something and find us. And it's not that it's not somebody walking in. And this is what a lot of people didn't understand. It's social media. Yeah, Somebody cool. <laughs> wants to just show a camera and then launch it out and mm. then it gets seen. Then you got everybody in here investigating. Yes, absolutely. And so that's really where a lot of this came in, where people had to follow tight because it's social media. Yeah, because all absolutely. you need is one person just to show something. And mm. then all of a sudden you're having to defend an action that you really had no control. Yeah, we were having to defend the mask wearing and yeah. the distancing and stuff so much. We got some negative reviews on Google because we enforced mask wearing. So it taught us like, okay, we have some values and we're going to stand up for those values. And you and can, you're strong that. enough to we do can, that. We can, and it didn't hurt us in the end it helped us there were so many people who felt safe coming here and again we're a family-friendly brewery you don't want to bring your kids and risk them getting sick your young kids so if you know you're going to a place that is sanitizing that's taking things very seriously that's keeping distance we got rid of a lot of tables to make sure there was space we expanded the patio we bought several new picnic tables and blocked off half the parking lot to be able to expand our outdoor space so we really leaned into that and i think two or three people got upset Nice. Okay, who needs them? Go yeah. somewhere else. There's, there were other ta- places in town that were not enforcing masks, I'm sure of it. Oh, yes. Um, there was one in particular, I recall, and I won't call them out by name, <laughs> but I will tell you that I've never set foot in that place again, that had a sign on the door that said, if you were wearing a mask, you could not come in. Oh, my so gosh. So there you have it. Okay. So thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you for the safety. <laughs> Absolutely. It taught us also to be proactive. Like, we did see other breweries around the state, other small businesses that did not know what to do that just struggled for so many months weeks trying to figure out how waffled back and forth yeah and 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 we just we said we are closing on this date we're going to spend that entire day that we're closed planning we are going to figure out how to make this work oh we also started selling our shirts through i can't remember the name of the company it's like an online print to order company so we made a bunch of different shirt designs We don't profit a lot off of it, but it was like another way for people to be able to support us, buy a shirt, we get a little money from it. Some called it the COVID series. And so there they would tie it to their brew and COVID. Yeah. (laughs) Like beer will help cure COVID (laughs) and things like that. So you play this whole bunch. Oh yeah, yeah. (laughs) So. You either don't care that you're sick or. (laughs) Yes. The other obstacle that you had probably less control over than COVID, or maybe more control, I'm not sure, but there was a year, year and a half stint of crazy construction. Oh my gosh. That was going on here where they were digging up roads and digging up sidewalks. You couldn't even get to your parking lot. You couldn't. (laughs) And that was one of those things that even if you knew it was coming, you couldn't stop it. Yeah, that was awful. That was harder than COVID. Really? Full stop. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, harder. I would agree with that. Because at least, you're right, during COVID, I had control over, I'm going to change my business model entirely overnight. And so was everybody else, or at least a majority of other businesses. people want to support you, they're all working from home, they need a beer at the end of the night, they've been stuck in their house with their kids who can't go to school. So that was, I don't want to say easy, because that, it wasn't, COVID was hard, but that was an easier obstacle for us to overcome, I think, especially once we got a rhythm down. The construction outside of our door was awful. One lane was open, but it didn't look like it, right? Because there's equipment everywhere and there's orange cones and there's barrels and everything everywhere. And it was, I mean, it was months of work. Mm -hmm. And they'd park an excavator right in front of our front door. Why? (laughs) <laughs> why it's a business they would dig a trench i'll never forget the day we're parked in our parking lot all of us that work here during the day and they've dug a trench through our parking lot entrance the whole length of the parking lot entrance and three feet wide 
we can't get in and out of the parking lot. <laughs> Why, there's cars in here. Why would you think that was a smart thing to do? They would turn off our water on a brew day. We use hundreds of gallons of water and they just turn off the water. There were so many issues with it. So we had a lot of conversations with the people in the city. There's only so much they're going to do for you. We would say, we feel like you should give us a credit some of some sort, right? Yeah. We provided even documentation. These were our sales last year. These were our projections for this year. This is what actually happened this year. We should be growing, not shrinking. And we're only shrinking because people think they can't get in here. We struck up huge social media campaigns, making sure people knew, hey, come watch the construction, bring your kids. <laughs> and then the city was nice enough to let us break the rules a little bit and let us put up a sandwich board at the end of Cameron Street at Cameron and Piccadilly so that you could see like brewery this way. I think there were arrows. And we put some signage up on this construction fencing around the Old Towers lot. We covered each window in the front with big, huge banners that said, we are open seven days a week. Please come see us. So we did everything we could. We made it, but that was very hard. And it took so much longer than they expected. And it was so much more inconvenient. And I will <laughs> tell you, as someone who just comes down here, doesn't look any better. Doesn't look any different. Look any different. It had nothing all to do with the aesthetic. When you watch these house renovation shows and they're like, we got to replace all your electrical, you don't get to see that but when you the spend house hundreds is done. Of thousands of dollars and something. it's the most expensive oh. thing that you do because after it was done, I came down, I'm like, what was all this for? Fun fact we have the oldest, I don't know if it's stormwater, water drainage, something. It was wood. The oldest in the <laughs> right. state of Virginia yeah. or maybe yeah. the nation. Yeah. Something wood insane. Yeah. So old, porous just really bad and so when we would have big rain i mean it, it's been a value add in some ways i think when we would have big heavy rains like there was a summer where we just had these drenching torrential rains which go for hours and anything low lying like our trench drains in the back and stuff they'd back up buildings across the street would have to close because their toilets were all backing up because there was just so much groundwater that right. had nowhere to go so that helped but that was rough. And you didn't get a lot of notice and weren't no. really apprised of the magnitude no. of that because that would have been something different too, that if they had come to you and said, we're going to start construction six months from this day and we estimate it's going to take this long and this is what we're thinking it's going to look like yeah. as we do it, that would have been an opportunity for you to then figure out, okay, what are we going to do when this happens? Let's start prepping our customers. Yeah. You're still going to be able to drive down here. You didn't get any of we that either. We didn't really get any of that. One of my favorite stories from that time is because it was such a bad, it was so bad. So we were brewing our first ever ESB, extra special bitter, which is a mild, delicious kind of mild beer. So we started a campaign for somebody to name that beer. And I think you got a gift card. It wasn't anything crazy, but we got so many good names launched. And so ESB is the name of the beer, stands for extra special bitter. The name somebody came up with was uh, expect street barriers. <laughs> ESB, expect street barriers. And they won. And that was so funny. That was our favorite thing that people came up with because that was true. Just expect street barriers. So we made it, but that was awful. Yeah, I remember when it was happening. It was awful. And they've done a lot. I mean, they're doing construction again now, just north of here. And then in 2016, so we had just opened, soft open March, grand opening in May. In December of 2016, they tore down the towers building and they blocked the lanes as well. Maybe even yeah. more than when they did this building. That they was blocked those lanes. as someone, so Carl obviously isn't from here. Mm. You came from Harrisonburg uh -huh. before you came here. As someone who was born and raised here, it was traumatic to yeah. see that building go down. I believe Darlington it. Towers had been there since I was born. That building had always, it was a hot mess. Yeah. And it was the yucky landmark that you used to get people to different places yeah. in downtown. But it was still that building. And then it was here one day and the next day I come down. And it was gone. Where did it go? And I just had to stop for a second at that light and think, what happened to that building? <laughs> Objectively, it was more attractive than the construction fencing and trash pit <laughs> right. we've got that's wow. been there since 2016. That's true. <laughs> that is a good point. Since 2016. <laughs> so, yeah, there's always something going on down here. We're grateful for the improvements. There are things that are needed. Hopefully, when they finish all of whatever they're doing with the groundwater, stormwater, there's supposed to be a stormwater collection ponds, I think, further north because we do get a lot of flooding. Right. And if anyone's familiar with the flooding that comes yes. down here on Loudon Street. So Cameron floods really badly. Well, Water Street. There, oh, yeah. There's actually Literally a street, street called yeah. Water Street because it yeah. turned into a river back yeah. in the day. This is rough. And once we got rid of the green space and put in our patio, there's nothing no, to catch the water. Yeah. If it's a good enough rain, it floods under the side door because oh, wow. it backs up. There's only so much water that can get through the one drain in the parking lot at the low point, And it brings a lot of muck yeah. and it clogs oh, it. Yeah. And so we do get flooding. Yeah. But. Any current, can't figure this out, 
here's something that we're trying to work around or this is something we'd like to do but we're running into this roadblock. Mm. Any of that kind of stuff going on now? Honestly, not really. One of the things that we are ramping up is our events. Events are just the best way to get people in the door. So we're always looking for fresh new events that mm. nobody else is doing or that we've never done just to get people in the door. We're always trying to do that, especially as we go into spring to help make up for how hard January and February always are in any business like this. Mm -hmm. um, so that's our biggest focus right now is growing that. You were telling Carl and I before we hit the record button, weddings. You're actually weddings. doing weddings yeah. here. Yeah, for a hefty fee that people will pay. <laughs> so we modeled it after what some of the wineries in town were doing. Of course, we know that we're not as shiny and fancy as a lot of wineries are, so we didn't charge as much as some of them do. But one of the amazing things here is it's a flat fee to rent. You buy beer only from us, of course. We won't allow you to bring outside beer in. But if you're having a private wedding, you get an ABC license for yourself. You bring in wine, you bring in cocktails. So many wedding venues have a list of preferred vendors or only allow these mm -hmm. vendors that they'll work with. Or if they offer food, you can't bring in can't outside bring out. food. And if you want yeah. something quirky, you're out of luck. Absolutely. No, we have no restrictions. The only big rule, we have a few rules. Don't drink if you're under 21. Please don't throw <laughs> glitter around in confetti. But we only allow our beer. But beyond that, please bring in any food you want. Bring in any beverages you want. You can dress it up a little bit, but a lot of people love it because it is kind of that, like, it's, it's a, a nice rustic space, industrial. but it's a little rustic. Yeah. Well, right now, we're sitting under this beautiful wooden mm -hmm. pergola that we built <laughs> that looks lovely with... The, yeah, uh, flowers, flowers wrap, wrapped, like big around flowers wrapped around it, it mm -hmm. and different things. We've got a projector that people will use for their kind of pre-wedding slideshows. And we've used this space. I have mm. used this space along with some groups that I'm associated with to host meetings here. Absolutely. To ha host get-togethers, to have gatherings yep. after work, before work. There's a wide range of things that this space is available for. Absolutely. So we do a lot of options during our open hours. So you can rent just our pergola during our open hours. Granted, there will be other customers, there'll be background music, but if you're just looking to have some friends and family over for dinner and want to guarantee that you get space for you or your group, you can rent that online. Private rentals, you just reach out to us through the website contact or call. We can talk about fully private rentals. And then before we open, seven days a week, we do a lot of children's birthday parties here before we open. Really? Yeah, we won't allow it while we're open because, you know, optics yeah, 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 <laughs> of yeah. a two-year-old's birthday party at a brewery. And with the parents um, sitting up there. We do have a lot of families with children, but we don't really want to celebrate a birthday party for kids. Yeah. We do a lot of birthday parties, like the 10 a.m. to noon range on a Saturday. We don't open till two. It's perfect. There's almost nothing a kid can ruin. I mean, I've had my kids' parties here because I've got some connections. <laughs> um, but uh, people go heavy with decorating the pergola area and, like, really decorating these tables. And then it looks great. You tie some balloons up. It's a good spot for bridal showers, baby showers. We have a lot of that. And then little kids' birthday parties before we open. So we're open to any and all for the most part within reason. What <laughs> are the hours here? So we are open seven days a week, but Monday through Thursday our hours are 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. Friday and Saturday, we're open 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. And then Sunday, our abbreviated hours are 2 to 6. And does that change with the seasons or it is that year-round? So actually, those were the hours we developed during COVID. <laughs> so once we were allowed to reopen, we were open later on Fridays and Saturdays till 11. On Sundays, I think we were open like 12 to 8. And really, Sundays are just not a crazy day. We found that the 2 to 6 p.m. range was when everybody wanted it. We're not a restaurant, so you're not going to come have brunch. You're not going to come have lunch after church. And because we're family friendly, a lot of people that come out with their kids, they got to be home by 6 because they got to feed dinner and shower and get ready for, for the next day. day. So those hours have worked out the best for us, and we've just maintained it. If we have a special event, our anniversary, we do a lot for Winchester Pride, things like that, we'll open at noon to do something special. How do you weather apple blossom? So we've talked about COVID <laughs> when nobody was here, yeah. and then you go to totally the other end of the spectrum with apple blossom where there are quite possibly hundreds of thousands yeah. of people here in town. Apple Blossom is weird. One or two years early on, we were swamped. We had people working the door, we were taking a cover, like we were ready and we were crowded. And then other years you're like, where are all the people? So it's hit or miss here. So we've been playing with our hours. On Friday is the firefighters parade. That was our big day. Like that's and the it's day. here. It, they literally it's all, line up they use on our bathroom camera and, and stuff. Yes. We're open for them to use even before we're open to the public. That's our bread and butter for Apple Blossom is that Friday. So we typically do pretty well that day. But because we're a little off the beaten path, it's not crazy, which I appreciate. And then on Saturday, when they do the grand feature, typically we're not opening until 5 p.m. We would just stay closed because we just weren't getting customers during the parade. Everybody's downtown. I think this year we might play around a little bit with opening early for pre-gaming before the grand feature parade and then 
maybe closing during it or just having one person work and then staying open until nine or 10. And then Sunday we either close for recovery day or we'll try to have a food truck out. Not a lot happens kind of thing. downtown on Sunday. By then, Everybody's everybody tired. is just, They're hungover. yeah. <laughs> it used to be that we would all then head to the park. Yes. Because there yes. used to be the Sunday in the park and every vendor, crafter, artist in the free world would set yeah. up at Jim Barnett Park and it would take the entire day to walk through. Yeah. But they don't do that That's anymore. a bummer, I know. It's not as insane as I think it might be if you were a brewery downtown on the walking mall, which That's we're true. grateful for. <laughs> We played around with different things, live music, DJ, a food truck. Like we've tested the waters and I think what works best for us is a food truck if we can get it. Because what you get on the midway is corn dogs and- It's all carnival food. Carnival food. People don't always want that. So we will set up a food truck here in our parking lot that has to come sneak in before the streets close and <laughs> must can never leave again until Sunday afternoon. And then just letting people have fun. Like, what variety of food trucks do you have here whenever you're Yeah, open? so a uh, little shout out to my favorite local food truck is Billy Sue. Have you heard of Billy? I haven't, but I've seen uh, your Facebook posts and keep thinking I got to get over here. First of all, Billy is maybe the nicest person you'll ever meet. He and his wife, Amanda, who does real estate and also helps on the truck. He's just a superb gentleman. We love him as a person. But his food, he does all sous vide meats. And, mm. and eggs and stuff. So he does an egg salad sandwich with pimento cheese. Wait, he does, what? Yeah, so all the meats are sous vide. Sous vide? I don't know what the past tense of sous vide is. <laughs> um, hey, I just learned a few weeks ago that the plural of Lego is Lego. Yes. There is no S. Yes. So that mom, what? I said Legos and no, an no, expert no, no. in the field I no idea. said to me, no, actually it's Lego. Sure, no, the plural of Lego is Lego. So I'll probably get corrected by my did 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 did. Yes. Right. <laughs> but he just does these beautiful sandwiches. So he's really fun. He plays around with his menu all the time. He comes out here at least once a week for the most part. And for different events, he'll create different menus. So on first Friday, we had a regular of ours come in and she spins old metal records, like 80s hair metal. And he did a metal menu some sandwiches that were different than he normally has, but then underneath it would say, make it metal, and you could add habanero mayonnaise to it, or a ghost ah. pepper aioli. He'll change things up. He'll do all kinds of fun stuff. So he does great breakfast foods, great sandwiches. He's doing Celtic Fest for us. He's just like a really great human. So he's our favorite guy to work with. We have a lot of other great people around. We work with barbecue trucks, Franklin's great, and he travels around Franklin's mm -hmm. barbecue. He's tremendous. One of our newer favorites is a hot box, which is smash burgers. What? Mm. In french fries. So they're out of Strasburg, but they are phenomenal. They also do a crispy chicken sandwich, I think, but they do three or four different smash burger options. Fresh cut french fries. Somebody else we've been working with newly is the Vegan Factory, which I was not sure how that would do in a town like Winchester. And they You're have surprised, done aren't you? so I, That well. doesn't surprise me. They have done so well, and their food is tremendous. I mean, it's so good. It does not taste like you're eating terrible vegan food. Not meat. Like, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. And so they do some really good work and have had great success here. So we're playing with different food trucks because we don't have a lot out here, really. And some food trucks expect, oh, well, we're only going to come out if we know we're going to make X amount of money. Right. I can't guarantee that. Yeah. If it's raining, nobody's going to be here. Yeah. Because Winchester doesn't leave the house if it's raining. <laughs> But if it's a beautiful Friday, you might sell out. And they do. A lot of people will sell out. I know Hotbox and Billy Sue sell out a lot. What advice would you have for somebody that is listening today and they too have always thought, hey, I've been brewing this beer in my basement <laughs> and I want to get started. Do you want the real answer? You've done. You've given, a, <laughs> you've given a really solid blueprint, quite yeah. frankly, during our conversation today on what to do and in some cases what, what not to do. Yeah. But what advice would you have? Would you tell them to run screaming from the building or would you encourage them? You know what? I'm going to be honest. I would tell them not to. I love it. I love it. Beer, the bubble is bursting. You have to really set yourself apart. So it works for us in a smaller town. But if we were in Richmond, where there oh, are yeah. so many breweries, or we were in even Nova, where there's so many breweries in the Loudoun area, I don't know. I'd love to think that we make really quality beer and that our staff is great and that our space is amazing. But sometimes Would that's not enough. Would we be successful enough. if there were 30 breweries around? I don't know. And so that's what you're seeing is breweries closing left and right in Richmond, in mm -hmm. Asheville, and in some of these towns that are known for craft beer, they're not making it work anymore. Leases, the cost of renting has gone up extraordinarily high. So what we're seeing is now we're about 10 years out from when... So I said in 2012, it became legal in Virginia to be able to have a tasting room. So a lot of breweries opened around about then and they signed a 10 year lease. Those 10 year leases are expiring and they're up for renewal and people cannot afford them. Cost of 
living, of course, has gone up, skyrocketed. And so we're seeing a lot of breweries that are like, I just I physically can't afford to double my rent, triple my rent. So I think opening up a small business can be amazing and incredible, and we've loved it. I think opening a brewery, I don't know that this is the time. I think that if you love craft beer, I think there are a lot of ways to get involved in craft beer. I think you can start by working at another brewery. We have a couple local beer and wine shops that are really successful. I think that that's great. Distribution companies, we need more mom and pop distribution companies because distribution companies right now, they're run by the big guys. They're run by the Bud Lights and the Millers mm -hmm. of the world. And they don't really care about the small, tiny Winchester Brew Works of the world. So we need smaller mom and pop distribution companies that focus on the little guy and push to get your beer in stores and restaurants. There's so many ways to get involved in the craft beer world without opening a brewery. And part of it is that if what you love is beer and brewing beer, you're not going to love running a brewery. It's <laughs> such is, a small percentage. This is why I've business. never gotten a job in a coffee shop. I love Ugh. coffee too much to work there. <laughs> you would hate it. I love customers. I've always done like customer service, hospitality. I love it. I love the people facing side of it. That's part of why I also got into it. But opening a brewery and running a brewery, such a small amount of it is beer. Mm -hmm. It's so much mm -hmm. marketing, business. We knew that going into it, but it definitely was a learning curve for us. And this all, Carl, I think goes back to everything that she's saying now goes back to what we started with talking about, which is doing your research, mm -hmm. knowing where you want to be. Is there a market for it? Is there going to be a market for it in 10 years? Because I think sometimes people go into this and think, oh, it's right, right now. But what's going to happen in 10 years, right. in 12 years, is that still going to work? And that's where you guys really come in to help shape and mold and get that information out to people. Yeah, I think you hit it right on the head. We as Americans think five years is too long. <laughs> So we don't plan for the long game. And the problem is that when you hit beyond five, people say, okay, what's next? Mm. And they really don't know what to do when next. So they keep doing the same old, same old. Mm. And eventually people get tired of the same old. And so numbers start doing this. And they, then all of a sudden they're hiring people to try to rebrand themselves. What you're doing, I give you tons of credit, you're always thinking about how do we keep ourselves that we're moving, but now we're not trying to Skyrocket. build a mountain. Yeah. You have to stay yeah, relevant. You're building a hill that keeps increasing mm -hmm. to eventually become a small mountain. And lots of people don't think that way. They want this instant growth curve. Uh. And they said, yeah, but when you hit the apex of it, what are you then going what? to do after that? Yeah. And so that means you're plateaued and you're flat like that. That's your revenue, that's mm -hmm. your growth. And I promise you, you'll get tired of it and you'll say, I want to be done with it because you see no future. Yeah, I mean, and just starting a business is so yeah. exhausting, right? Yeah. Like by the time you're open, you're like, did we, should we have done this? It's a yeah. lot. Yeah. Um, I need to take a vacation maybe why I say before I'm even open. And, and I, I give you tons of credit too that both couples have stayed together. We have. Yeah, and, and that's a thing that a lot of people don't talk and about. And continue to have Between children. Us, we have four kids. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. amazing. Uh, yeah. And they've stayed friends. And we yeah. stay friends. We spend all of our free time together yeah, too. We uh, vacation uh, together. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I would not trade it. Absolutely. I, there's no regret here. It is just, it is a labor of love. And if what you love is beer, you will not love opening a brewery. Yeah. <laughs> no, and that's what they always say. They say, do your hobby. And yeah. I said, remember, it won't be your hobby after right. you start it, the It business. takes some of the joy out of it. Actually, yeah. one of our brewers that we hired after my business partner had a child, he was a very talented home brewer and he owned a homebrew store in the area. He won lots of homebrew awards. Mm -hmm. He came to us and said, please consider me to replace Bonnie when you need a brewer. I would love to. And we are like, absolutely. You're yeah, very well. We know you're very you. talented. Yeah. He hated it because it took the fun out of it because you got people saying, we have to brew this or you have to be here on this day to brew this thing. And it took some of that joy out of it because you're not just making a couple gallons that you get to bottle and drink at your house with your friends you're no we got to make money yeah. on it and, and you gotta, you've got to watch and in your basement i would assume that you set it and forget it uh, yeah, and absolutely. that doesn't work no. here you've no. got to be if something goes wrong you do it at home who cares <laughs> if you do it here you're dumping out 100 gallons of beer so it's not the same and i think he didn't love it the way that he thought he would as a job it was different owning a homebrew store and selling to hobbyists that's a very different story yeah and the thing was, in a way, probably he was potentially looking, do I scale? And this was a way to say, no, to test I that don't. market and yeah. learn that yeah. answer. Yeah, and that's a good experience for people to, yeah. and I always tell them, go experience it first so that way you know what the real world aspect of it is, and then you make that it's decision. It's very different than what you think. Yeah. yeah.
thank you for taking some time to chat with us oh today. Gosh, thank you. Where this can they so find lovely. you online, Facebook, website, yep, all of that sort of thing? Com. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. You'll find all of our events on Facebook is where we pretty much put everything. And you always list which food truck is going to be here we when, so that's a good way. We have food trucks, beer releases, any other special events are online. Anything we sell tickets for, we post those on our website that you can buy those online. So we use Square for our point of sale, so it's super easy to use online. And you have merch yeah. in the store, gift cards, you can so book a party, stuff. all yeah. of the things. Yeah, so just call, email, Facebook message, whatever. And I don't know if by the time it airs, the cranberry orange shandy will still be on tap, oh, man, but so that good. sounds like something I, because next... so Holly and I have gone round and round <laughs> because I have done an entire beer podcast series with a lot of the local breweries. She and Bonnie have been on the show. I don't know how many times so I've had good. other breweries on the show. I don't drink beer. And this one keeps saying, you need to try mine. It, it was almost <laughs> like when I met my husband and said, I don't eat venison. <laughs> and I married a hunter. And everybody in his family kept saying, you haven't had it the way I prepare yeah. it. And I will say, full disclosure, I do eat deer burgers now. I have had mm -hmm. deer steak and tenderloin. It isn't my first choice. Yeah. But it's not as bad as I thought it was in my head. And <laughs> this one keeps saying, I'm going to create this shandy Shandy's for you. Because that's love. what you'll love. It's got orange in the name. <laughs> it's got orange in the name. And then our next one will be key lime shandy which is mm. ah. top notch. And I did want to give a quick shout out to the SBA because when we were opening and planning everything, we met with our local SBA in the Harrisonburg. SBDC. SBDC yeah. in Harrisonburg. And they were so great in helping us with our business plan. I had drafted something up and we needed a lot of help with the financials and just making sure it all made sense because it was so new to us and just so helpful and encouraging. And I recommend them to anybody. I was sorry to hear of Joyce's passing at yes. the SBDC in Harrisonburg. Yeah. She was phenomenal. Yeah. I yeah. really, was. really liked Joyce. Yeah, she was great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. This was great. Well, that's it for the Valley today with the SBA. And I would be remiss if I did not do a belated congratulations when we recorded this show. The Greater Good Awards for the Top of Virginia Regional Chamber had not yet taken place. They have since taken place and Winchester Brew Works won Small Business of the Year. So kudos to both Bonnie and Holly. And I was really excited that I already had her on the schedule to do a radio show before we even knew that they had won. I'll be back tomorrow with a brand new episode of The Valley today. So meet me here for that just a few minutes after noon.